من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد صلي على محمد I begin in Allah's name the beneficent and the merciful and I welcome you all to this program in Ramadan Kareem Ramadan Mubarak it's a month of blessing it's a month in which we increase our awareness and when Quran uses the word taqwa, which means God consciousness, we need to understand what does that mean because it needs to be pragmatic in the way we understand the word taqwa. Taqwa is very much used in the Quran and this word is very deep, very rich, and it's a practical tool that the Quran establishes very clearly. And in these nights that I'll be speaking Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, Inshallah, our goal is to enrich our souls with understanding so that when we do practice our religion in the month of Ramadan, it's not only done with confidence, but it's done with the kind of effect that enables us to impart that positive nature that comes out of these practices towards those around us. Because secondary behavior where our characteristics and how we perform in society is just as impactful as it is for us to apply it upon ourselves because at the end of the day, we are the product of our surroundings. So those around us are also impacting us either positively or negatively. I welcome you all, it's an honor, and inshallah we hope that these nights are fruitful and we will discuss briefly uh, the effects of this blessed month of Ramadan and particularly the Quran being the book that it is and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes this book so much especially in this blessed month of Ramadan on that note my respected sisters and brothers in Islam assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah al-Baqarah verse number 183 starts with ya ayyuhalladhina amanu kutib alaykum as-siyam so fasting, as you know, has been enjoined upon us as it was enjoined preceding to us, meaning those before us were also commanded to fast. كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ So meaning that the injunction of fasting, the injunction of prayer, the injunction of those kinds of regulations that God has placed upon us is nothing new that has begun 1400 years ago with the Holy Prophet. The conditions by which Allah has laid upon mankind to succeed in this world of trials and tribulations has been established, those fundamental behaviors have been established since Adam's time. That means that we know that Adam was prescribed prayer and we know that Adam was prescribed fasting, the fundamental practices of human behavior that enables us to reach the high levels of maturity in our spirituality can only be possible by the command of Allah, as Allah says, وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُوا لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Meaning in Surah Al-Jum'ah, Allah says that هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَطْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِ وَيُزَّكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُوا لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Meaning Allah says that He sent prophets from among yourselves بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ Right, مِنْكُمْ From us, مِنْهُمْ, from them, same. The combination Qur'an addresses on both sides. يَطْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِ They came and they recited the signs of God. 
Okay. They purified you. الكتاب, and they taught you the law. والحكمة, and gave you wisdom. And before it, you were in utter darkness. Meaning, if Allah did not send prophets and guidance, then we would have been in a state of darkness. So we know that these injunctions of fasting, prayer, had to have come with prophets. And Adam السلام, was the first prophet and the first mankind on earth. And therefore, he must have been given these transactions. So when Allah says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Meaning that this has been enjoined upon those before you, we can say that it was also enjoined upon the first human being. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, we may ask the question, this month of Ramadan, why is it instituted as a whole month, 30 days? Why is it that within this month, not only are we enjoined upon fasting, but many amazing events took place in this month? What is it about this month that is so special versus the remaining 11 months? And Allah addresses this in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 183, and we've done some PowerPoint presentations as you see verse 183 184 and 185 describes this month of Ramadan so I'd like to describe it so we understand it and look at the benefits of it so so the objective into why Allah has established fasting for us is that we achieve, once again, the word taqwa, meaning achieve God consciousness, which we use the word piety. When we ask people, what is taqwa? In the East, they'll say fear of God. Having fear of God, being fearful of God. This term is used a lot in the Eastern world because our understanding of fear of God is not negative, but the Western world tends to see that word as a negative word, fear of God, seems to be the antithesis to the love of God, and somehow it has a negative connotation. But fear of God here, if we were to use that word, we must qualify it immediately to say, fear of God to lose his mercy, fear of God to negate his love, fear of God to be reckless to love him when he loves us already, fear of God to deny ourselves the infinite mercy of God, that fear is like a parent who fears a child you know, from failing. So there's a fear that my child should not fail. There's a fear that my child should not get sick. So due to that, we promote our children to become more proactive and healthy, and we institute them in educational facilities because we have a fear that our children should not go astray. That's positive fear. So the same term is used with taqwa, and taqwa means it's, it's, uh, it has that positive, what we call, standing. Now, in the next verse, 184, Allah says, Ayyaman ma'adudat. So prescription is for a select number of days. It's a select number of days, meaning that Allah is saying to us, I have not instituted fasting upon you all the time, 365 days a year but rather we have chosen a select number of days which is sufficient for you. And research shows that, and we'll talk about it in the end, intermittent fasting, for example, the benefits of fasting, why the pharmaceutical industries, for example, and certain businesses do not promote fasting. And the reason is because the benefit of fasting outweighs the, the dangers of not fasting. And that's very important for us to understand. Now, I want us to put this also and plug it into the divine scheme of things. If you can make your, put your phones in, in silence, inshallah, that would be really appreciated. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So Allah says, Ayyaman ma'adudat, faman kana minkum maridan aw ala safarin, fa'iddatum min ayyami ukhar. Meaning that if you are sick or you are traveling, then postpone it for a later time, meaning before the next Ramadan. So look how Allah is merciful in saying, I'm instituting this 
And you'll see that the verse continues that Allah does not want to make religion difficult upon us. Allah said, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ We don't want to make religion difficult for you. There is this common understanding between us that religion is a burden upon us. Many a times I see youth asking me, brother, doesn't religion stop me, inhibit me? It prohibits me from expressing my freedom of choice. This is a misstatement. For if you remove laws, the byproduct, the end product of no law is what we call a lawless society. And a lawless society promotes anarchy. And anarchistic societies are the most dangerous societies to live in. So laws protect freedom of expression. Laws protect growth. Laws protect peace and harmony and what we call a, a, a progressive society. So when we say that God has instituted laws upon us that are haram and halal and makru and mustahab and mubah issues, we should not say, oh God, why are you putting this on me? Flip it the other way and say, imagine we remove that. The danger is infinitely greater. While you and I may have difficulty in appreciating the commandments of Allah in that he has instituted fasting upon us in Ramadan to such a degree that the kafara, meaning the penalty, should one break their fast willingly without any valid reason in order to challenge the law of Allah, is the kafara is you must fast for 60 days. You're allowed to fast for 31 consecutive days, then you can skip a few days, but you must make up 60 days of fasting for each day of violation. Now you and I may say, by the way, you can also feed 60 poor people. But the point is nonetheless that there is a penalty. And we may ask, why did Allah institute penalty upon us? Not because Allah is vindictive, not because Allah is treacherous, not because Allah is harsh. Allah has done this upon us to show us the gravity that fasting is extremely important. And to show us that don't think twice. Because if you say, look, God is so merciful, he's so forgiving, and he says, if you break your fast, you know, it doesn't matter, just make it up someday, if you can. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. What, you, what happens is when you violate what we call the core prescriptions of humanity, humans will invalidate it. It's just like, it's like when you come to school and there are law, rules that are not enforced and the student does not feel that they are an important rule, then they will violate it or they will follow it at will. Just to give you a quick example, look at prayer. Muslims have been told to uphold prayers three periods a day, five times a day. Allah has aqim as salah Aqim as salah wa'mur bil ma'roof. This is fi'l al-amr, meaning God has commanded, maintain prayer. And Quran consistently emphasizes the importance of maintenance of prayer. In fact, that importance is so heavy, if you and I understand it, we as Muslims should sometimes wonder, why has God made this prescription so heavy? Examine our Judeo-Christian brethren. If we look at the Christian faith, in the time of Isa, according to the Bible, Jesus prayed and he fasted. In fact, they say Jesus fasted so much that his skin was pale because he loved to fast. And when Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa, prayed, he put his face on the ground. It's clearly written in the Bible. He put his face on the ground. He bowed. He did complete sujood. As Quran said, Rukkaan sujjadan yabtaguna fadla min Allah wa ridwana. Simahum fi wujuhi min atharis sujood. Thalika mathalum fi tawrat wa mathalum fi injil. This has been mentioned in Torah and Injil, that they did rukkaan sujjadan, they did ruku, meaning genuflection, and they did sujood, 
meaning they did bowing of their heads on the ground. Quran states it. But examine our general Christian population today. There's over 2 billion of them. 99% plus does not do that. There is no prescription of prayer. In Christianity, you pray when you want, how you want. Even the Sunday Mass is not obligatory. It's a choice. And there is no penalty if you don't attend Mass. And Christmas Eve is a choice for them. So notice the injunctions have been invalidated. Paul said the laws of God are no longer essential for Jesus has died for our sins on the cross. So he took the law and discarded it because the Judeo idea, the Jews of the time were known to be very law abiding. The Jews actually were making money with law. And law was the symbol of Judaism at that time. I'm just giving a simple example. Whereas you find when Christians gave up the institution of prayer by God upon its followers, the entire Christian population didn't know what to do because I don't have to, so why should I? It's like a student in school, I don't have to study, so why should I? I don't have to do my homework, so why should I? I don't have to pass the exam, so why should I? There will be a few that will do it, but on a collective institution, you will find it starts to degrade. And when it starts to degrade, the entire institution of education becomes anarchistic and it no longer has any value. So when Allah has instituted fasting upon us, just as he has instituted prayer, it is to ensure that the human race remains vigilant and persistent in its ways in order to ensure that humanity has good behavioral patterns. And as we say, discipline is part and parcel of success and growth. So when Allah says, we have enjoined upon you, and should you violate it, here's the punishment. Now a person can say, I don't have to follow God, I don't believe in God, or I don't have to do what he tells me, I'll cherry pick. The fitra, the conscience, is going to bite us. You know, I give you an example, we have some students who come to school and say, I don't want to pray. It's interesting. During prayer time, they say, I don't want to pray. I said, why not? I, I don't want to pray. I said, are you Muslim? He said, yes. And do you believe that God has made prayer a law? He said, yes. But you don't want to pray? He said, no. I said, okay, no problem. Give up your faith. Relinquish your Islam. Say I'm not Muslim right now. Give it up. He says, no, I can't. I said, why don't you? Go ahead. Since you want to disobey God blatantly, openly, then relinquish your iman and become an agnostic right now in front of me. I dare you. He said, no, I can't. I said, why can't you? Are you loyal to your father and your mother? Are you loyal to your community? He looks at me, says, no, I'm a Muslim. I said, by what standard? You're cherry picking. Explain to me. Why do you call yourself a Muslim? He's like saying, I'm an American citizen, but I'm not going to abide by the Constitution of the United States. Does that make sense? Maybe it makes sense to some people, but you know what? When you do get caught for violating the basic laws of this country, don't be surprised if you get punishment. We all know that. And we all have to admit that, yes, I did violate. I mean, I do agree that I'm an American and I've borne allegiance to this flag because it is my dominion. Now, this is what we call secular in idea, but here's the divine. So then that person starts to say, oh, I said, give it up. I said, no, I'm not willing to give it up. I said, then there it is. It's holding you. That constriction that you have within your heart to say that I'm not going to give up my Islam, then what is wrong if I'm a Muslim encouraging you to follow that rule? Am I wrong? And the person says, no. I said, thank God there is a law that we as Muslims can encourage each other and what we call remind each other to say, brother, this is important. But of course, the best akhlaq 
is not to force religion down a person or to say, if you don't pray, I'm going to beat you up. No. لا إكره في الدين. There is no compulsion in religion. قد تبين الرشد من الغي. Truth is clear from error. So Allah says, speak to them with burhan. Show them the truth. Show them the value. Let them come because they love it. But also make them acutely aware that if you're going to insist on swearing by a faith, then start to practice it. Because if you give it up, you will become like the Christians of today who are good people. They love God. They have a desire to achieve the high stations of paradise. But the institution has failed them by not giving them any kind of injunction by which on a communal level to follow and hence people are making it up as they go. So when Allah says, Kutiba alaykum as siyam, you and I should say, Alhamdulillah, oh my Lord, thank you for enforcing this upon us so that we all become God conscious at a communal level. Thank you that we all have to obey it and thank you for making the punishment severe so that we all become aware of our obligations because at the end of the day, it's good for us. And thank you for us sitting together and breaking fast together. And thank you for holding back and being abstinent in our drinking and eating so that we become more conscious of our obligations, so that we have more empathy and more sympathy for society. Thank you. But there's one thing for you and I individually to be fasting. You know, many a times in Rajab and Shaban, we have people who fast for the entire month. And sometimes we're serving breakfast or we're serving lunch and the couples come in or husband comes in or wife comes in or a parent comes in or a person, anybody. He said, come on, join us for lunch. He said, no, 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 thank you. I'm fasting today. He said, oh, mashallah, that's very nice. The impact of an individual fasting when the rest do not have to is vastly different when we all have to do it. And I swear, examine the world. Nobody on earth today observes prayer and fasting and pilgrimage at the communal level, on the, at the highest level of society than we as Muslims. Isn't this a gift of God? Think about it. You and I may think, oh my God, Ramadan is here. I can't wait for the moon to show up before it ends now. I mean, I can't eat now for 30 days. Oh my God, I was planning to go, you know, Swimming every day, now I can't. I got to change my plans. You know, I was, I'm, a, I, I'm a workaholic. I love to work out in the gym in the afternoon. Now I can't do it because I'm going to be so thirsty. So difficult. Well, think about it. So Allah continues in this verse beautifully, and He says, and I'll just read the English part. For a certain number of days, but whoever among you is sick on a journey, then he shall fast a like number of other days. And those who are not able to do it, may effect a redemption. Here, Quran calls the word fidya. Fidya is a redemption. So let's say you're sick, terminally sick. For the entire month you cannot fast, or let's say you know for the rest of your life, at least at your current state, you cannot fast. The rule, the rule of Islam states, if you're terminal and you cannot fast, it will harm you, you must not fast. It's forbidden. Let's not try to be more Muslim than the Prophet, okay? Uh, some people want to be, you know, like more English than English. You know, you want to be more American than the American. Let's not try to be more. Now, oh, brother, Maghrib is three. It's too short for me. I'd like to do four. <laughs> no, Maghrib is three. Keep it that way. There's a reason for a prescription. Don't start changing things. So if you're sick, don't fast. Now, if you're on the borderline, you can, but you're not sure, then fast. Until it gets bad, then break it. But Allah says, let us say you're terminally incapable of, let's say you're suffering and you're constantly on some kind of a uh, medication system. Then Allah says, give fidya. Fidya is three quarters of a kilogram, which is roughly about 1.8, 1.9 pounds of rice, wheat, of grain to the needy, to a poor person. Feed one poor person for each day you miss your fast. And the rule states, and I'm just going to say this really quickly, just as if we're interested to know, that let us say for 10 years, you, God forbid this person was in that state of terminal illness. In the 11th year, they overcame it. They no longer have this problem. The rule states 
that if you overcame it on the 11th year, you will only pay back the 10th year, but the remaining past nine years, you will ignore it. You don't have to pay back. But the previous year that you missed because of your illness, you will pay it back. Now, your mind is probably thinking, okay, that makes sense, but what if I cannot? What if it's difficult? Look what Allah says. Allah says, then they shall, in other words, for a certain number of days, uh, whoever does good spontaneously. Now, Allah says that if you cannot, let's say you're a poor person, you can barely feed yourself. Okay. In Islam, the beauty of the religion Islam is its flexibility. Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. We do not put a burden upon you except that which you can handle. لا يكلف الله. Taklif is upon us not because God is sitting there with a whip ready to whip us because we're going to violate. No. And Allah specifically tells us this. He says, it is good for you and I'm enjoining it for you. Look, and I just gave you an example. You know, I look at our Christian brethren and they have no system. So when you and I have friends who are non-Muslims, particularly Christians, Jews especially, and you find at prayer time they're not going to pray, don't say, ah, look at them, they're having fun. Now me, I got to leave this and I have to go and do my prayer. You see, Islam is so prohibitive. Don't say that. Say it the other way, like, wow. God has a system for me, I'm chosen, I'm special. You know, I never understood the value of that until one day, you know, I had a very close Christian family. I used to travel with a lot. They were my friends. They used to teach me martial arts and I used to teach them tennis. We used to do exchange of services. And they were Christian family. Very, very good people, but Christian. And I remember I, I was very, I, they, they knew all my laws because when I was with them, I said, I don't eat haram. They said, what is haram? What is halal? Explain to us. So I told them everything, you know. This is the kind of food I must eat. I cannot. I'm not afraid. You want to be my friend? Then you come halfway to my standards as I come to yours. But let's not give up our standards. Some of us growing up in this society, we wish we could give up our names, our Islam, to appease the other side. Don't ever do that. That family respected me a lot. They said, we respect you because you're not giving up your faith. We're not like you. But we admire you because you haven't given up your faith. And I learned that even in the university. I would never bargain my faith with anybody, with all due respect. And my friends used to respect me more than their friends. Because they used to say, you stand for your faith. Now, it doesn't make me anything special. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that for that reason. I am saying you and I should never sell our religion for any price. Allah says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَتَقَلَّبُ فِي الْقُلُوبُ وَلَا بِصَارِ Men who don't bargain for any price. Men here is generic. رِجَالٌ doesn't mean men without women. It means universally. That's the language of the Quran. لَا تُلْهِهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ They don't bargain nor do they sell themselves, nor do they submit in the way of Allah. So I remember I was water skiing one day, and I had just learned to water ski. I was just getting the hang of it. And I was a teenager at that time, and it was tough for me to get up you know, on my skis. And I finally got it. It was the most amazing feeling, you know, gliding on water. It's the most incredible feeling. The same water I was created from, which can drown me, <laughs> which I must drink from, those of you who are fasting are very thirsty right now. You know, there's nothing more precious to you than water. One brother came to his brother, I'm starving, I'm thirsty. I just want water. I said, if I give you gold and I give you water, which one will you take? <laughs> water, of course. And let's say you can't trade gold for water. Because <laughs> I know some kids will say, brother, I'll take the gold and I'll go buy more water. <clears throat> so I'm gliding and I'm feeling really good. And suddenly, you know, this is an amazing experience. Suddenly the boat stops. And I, you know, when it stops, you sink when you go down. And they're pulling me. So I was visibly annoyed. I said, what did you do? I didn't give you the thumbs down. Why'd you stop? They said, well, it's prayer time. You got to go pray. And you know, it, it was embarrassing because I had forgotten, but they didn't forget. They said, look, it's prayer time. And you know, we made that deal. We will do this. And we were there since 10 o'clock in the morning. It's prayer time. It's past noon. Sorry, we got to stop. We're going to take the boat back. 
They're all non-Muslims, but they changed their structure just for me. I never appreciated that until that moment. I got on the boat and I realized, wow, that's incredible. These are my friends who respect me, but I haven't given up my faith. Look how Allah is honoring me, that while I'm having the best time of my life, a non-Muslim is reminding me of the importance of prayer time to keep me in check, but they respect me because of this law of God, that God has set a rule at the time for me to follow, which others, other religions don't have it. I hope you and I understand this, that the gravity of this gift of God in this month, especially in this month of Ramadan, let's not underestimate it. But let me conclude here because my time is almost up. Allah says that it is better for you to fast if you can, and it brings you towards closeness. The next verse, Shahru Ramadan. الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ Now notice, as soon as Allah introduces Ramadan, He introduces us as a month of the Qur'an. Meaning this is not a month of fasting, Qur'an says. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ is 183. But as soon as Allah addresses Shahru Ramadan, verse 184, He says, Shahru Ramadan, الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ then immediately, Allah is talking about the Qur'an. He completely keeps Ramadan as a subset of Qur'an. And I'm going to conclude on this. Very quickly, Shahru Ramadan, الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ So Allah is describing this book, Al-Qur'an, which is the guidance for all of mankind. It is what deciphers wrong from right. It is, as Allah says in the Qur'an, he says, the month of Ramadan is that in which Quran was revealed, a guidance to man, clear proofs of the guidance, and distinction. Therefore, whoever of you is present in the month, he shall fast. Notice, Allah is talking about the Quran as the description of Ramadan. To show you how important it is for you and I to indulge in maximum reflection in the Quran, for Ramadan is inseparable from the Quran and the Qur'an was revealed in this blessed month. In fact, all major scripture, scriptures, Tawrat, Zabur, Injil, and Qur'an, all four of them were revealed in this month of Ramadan. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. And Allah says, if you experience it, you must practice it. Very important. But look what Allah says after, just to appease us. He says, if you are sick and on a journey, again Allah repeats, if you are sick and on a journey, don't do it. Fast afterwards, no problem. Listen to the next verse. Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ yusra." Allah desires to make it easy for you. Okay? He does not desire for you difficulty. And that you should complete the number. So any one of us thinking, Ramadan is difficult, I'm so addicted to coffee, I'm so addicted to my morning tea, you know, I'm addicted to whatever that I take during the day, it's become part of my habit. Allah is saying, I do not, I do not want to put difficulty on you, I want to make it easy for you. So in conclusion to this, the benefits of fasting, and I'll briefly conclude on this, that you will notice that the benefit of fasting is that research shows intermittent fasting the benefits, okay, you find that your mind becomes sharper, your health becomes better, your digestive system becomes more efficient, although I haven't written that up there, but you find that it lowers your insulin levels. As you know, when you got high insulin levels, you crave more sugars. You will find that it's great for weight loss. Now, intermittent fasting, even the rest of the year, researchers show that when your body is under control with its ratio of weight, you find that you suffer less diseases because when your body is at an optimal weight, the stress on our organs is minimal. You find that there's lower oxidative stress and inflammation. This is all research shown. Improved heart health. We've got cardiologists, physicians here who can raise their hand and say, brother, I concur. He concurs. Uh, Increased growth of neuronal activity, brain activity, it actually causes expansion of the brain. Glial cells that are formed in our brain, when we have any kind of what we call critical thinking, and we create neuronal connections, 
you find that when you do critical processing and thinking, it's increased when you are in a state of fasting, and it prevents Alzheimer's diseases as one of the byproducts of fasting. Now, what we find is that, let's look at the reverse. Now, what is fasting about? To make us more God conscious. What is God consciousness? Let me define it very briefly. God is the ultimate good. Let's be practical. God is the absolute good. He creates only for good. What is his modus of good? Mercy. Allah says, Kataba ala nafsi rahma. I have enjoined upon myself mercy. Ask any human being on earth, mercy, is it good or bad? They will tell you mercy is good. It brings good results. Mercy. What is the components? What are the components of mercy? Creation with goodness. Create everything good. Give everything good potential. You know what's another high level of mercy? Free will. The power to dictate your own destiny. But under that power, you must have the power to destroy. Because free will is impossible if you don't have the ability to do the opposite. So under that condition, you and I, as the best creation among creations, is you and I, we've been given the power to choose our own destiny. This is huge. While we have this enormous mercy, and we've been positioned and designed, and our body has been designed to be optimal in operation when we are stress-free, when we are in a healthy environment, when we're in an environment full of grace and gratitude, and the body starts to react positively, you will find that we start to give off positive energy. We live longer, our disease factors are less, our burdens are less. And if you want to understand that, go to hospitals and see those people who are bedridden. Ask them, what is one thing you wish? They will tell you, we wish we can get out of this place. When people get heart replacements and they're asked, what's the first thing you're going to do once you get your new heart? They say, we're going to go outside when it's raining. We want to feel the rain on our faces. True, documented, real questions and answers that were given. You would think that, no, don't you want to go out there and raise a million dollars and buy yourself a palace and a nice fancy car? No, I just want to feel the rain fall on my face. Why? Because that mercy I have ignored all my life. There's too much mercy around us. These lights going off, humans sitting around us, the air that you and I are breathing, everything is a mercy. We have made all of this mercy for you. And Allah says, We have made a calling to you. If you're grateful, we'll give you more. If you're ungrateful, we'll punish you. What is gratefulness? When you and I fast, we become grateful. When you and I abstain, we become grateful. When we pray, we become grateful. We become cognizant of our submission. We become humbled. And I tell you, on a communal level, on a global scale of 8 billion people, nobody's got this chemistry. Nobody has this mechanism except Islam. With all due respect to thousands of other religions, nobody's got it. That's why they say by the year 2050, stat statisticians have noted, by the year 2050, the number one religion on earth will be Islam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So gratitude. Let's look at those who complain. You find people who complain. And I see that even at our school. You see kids complaining about every little thing. Why are they complaining? With all due respect, they're probably getting it from someone else. Someone is feeding into their ears. When you see people complaining, the most likelihood is that somebody said something which got twisted, which became Chinese whisper. It became something completely different, which became so negative. It started catching momentum like a snowball. And the next thing you know, everybody's starting to complain about it and wants to break apart. Complaining. Research shows that complaining actually, actually, if you look at it right there, it shrinks the brain. And it creates connections that leads to greater complaining. And secondhand complaining means that if you hang around people who complain, you will feel negative. Your aura will be negative. You will have that uneasiness in your heart. You will not feel happy. You will feel dissatisfied. And you know the worst feeling of dissatisfaction is when you eat, you drink. No matter what you do, you just don't feel right. That's the sign of ingratitude. Okay? And it increases your cholesterol level. It causes diabetes, as we know, because it also leads to obesity, by the way. And strokes. 
and it releases cortisol, which raises blood pressure. And by the way, the minute you are grateful, cortisol levels drop by 23%. Researchers have shown that the minute you indulge in gratitude, meaning you start thinking and feeling positive about life, your cortisol levels drop by 23%. That's huge if you understand chemistry and biochemistry. Okay? And it enlarges the brain, increases neuronal activity, and then you start to become solution-oriented. So we know problems are here to stay, and we know that we will always be facing, with pro we will always be facing problems. That's life. That's beautiful. If there are no problems, it will be a dull, boring world. Problems are good. It's like you go to the gym, and you're super muscular, and now you're raising a 20-pound dumbbell. You said, no problem. <laughs> You go to 30 pounds, no problem. You go to 40 pounds, no problem. You're looking in the mirror, I said, no problem. Then you go to 70 pounds, you know, ah, problem. And the brain says, good, that's the one I want. Why problems? Because you don't grow without problems. But the difference is you approach the problem as a solution. Solution-based problem solving is in and of itself zikr of Allah. And we'll talk about it, inshallah, tomorrow night. May Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah, to enjoy this blessed month of Ramadan. And while you, especially you, my young brothers in the front and sisters, when you're fasting, anytime you feel hungry, say, no, alhamdulillah, what a dhikr. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, my greatest desire is to be in armor, defending Islam while I'm fasting. That state of fasting on a battlefield when you're thirsty in a desert. You know, you and I are living in very comfortable environments, concrete based. You go into dusty environments that are very hot, okay, and very arid as they say, you know, where there's a lot of heat and you dry up within minutes. In the desert, it's not easy to fast. But Imam says, my mind is so conditioned that a little food is sufficient when I break my fast. We should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the strength to become like him and the prophets because they were of that character that loved to be abst abstinent because fasting was a positive move, a positive social move, and it brings positive realities. It makes us become more appreciative, more grateful, and to increase our empathy for the poor. And as you know, Muslims become most generous in the month of Ramadan, and there's a reason for that because when we start to feel a little pain with our fasting, we start to consider those who really don't have food. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana aghfir lana wa li ikhwanina alladhina sabaquna bil iman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan lilladhina amanu. Rabbana innaka raufur rahim. Wa akhir al-da'un alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa assalamu alaykum jameean wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As you know, we will have salah for those of you who want to join with salat al-jama'ah. We are testing out a restaurant called Beiti, which is close by, that we would be going there, but you know, it's uh, with donations, although there are sponsors for that, but seats are limited. So those of you who will be joining us, we ask you to sign up. Uh, inshallah, depending on how things go, if the audience increases, then we will do the iftar here at, at WISE in the, in the near future. But we are honored that you've participated, and may Allah bless you all, and we are, we're, honored if you will join us also for iftar and by the way tonight